it's just a funny thing how you can look at things in terms of like this really cartoonish Flintstones understanding of how the Paleolithic and how hunter gatherers actually worked. But then whenever you actually think about it and read about it and go really in depth and look into the nuances, a lot of like a lot of individual parts of that story end up reversing compared to what you hear on social media. And it's 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 hilarious. It's also terrible. It's like no matter how much I say these things to people, no matter how many links I provide, no matter how many whatever arguments I have, like most of the time people just like keep just plowing on with their like misconceptions and the things that they want to believe. Ladies and gentlemen, I'm thrilled to have Kevin Bass on the show. And Kevin has got a background in medical anthropology and biology. He's done a ton of work on nutrition. He's working on becoming a doctor. And you're also in a PhD program. So that's a whole lot of academia. How long have you been in the ivory tower? Two, like forever. Like, two. oh my God. This is the worst question. It's like asking a woman, like, how old she is. Like, how old are you? Um, you're at a bar. You, how are you? No, uh, 20 years, you know, 20 years now. So I entered college when I was 18. I'm now in my mid thirties and, uh, yeah, almost 20 years. It's crazy. And even during the time that I took off from med school, I worked in research. I'm a nerd. I love this stuff. So, yeah. Well, I, I come from an era when being in the ivory tower is not necessarily a bad thing. It's a pre this whole, you know, anyone who works for a university is a corrupt uh, tool of wokeism. So I, I know that hasn't permeated the sciences quite as much as the social sciences. So I'm glad to be talking with, uh, with somebody in the tower. Well, I mean, I, uh, the tower is good. It is a means of um, getting dedicated time to study subjects in a specialized way to then uh, generate a level of expertise that you can't really do if you're doing it part-time. So that part is good, but the other aspect of it, and I guess because I'm doing a joint program, I'm doing an MD, PhD program, the MD side of me, the medical doctor, future medical doctor side of me says that in the end, uh, a lot of what matters is what happens in the real world. So uh, I take that part very seriously as well. So. Okay. So I first became aware of you, uh, on some of your epic fights online <laughs> around the whole, in the diet wars, right? Where people are like, you know, the carnivore diet is the way to go. You know, you need nothing but elk meat and you, if you want dietary variation, you should add in pork and you should add in beef and you should add in chicken and shellfish. And then with elk chicken beef pork and shellfish you've got a well-rounded diet kind of the <laughs> jordan peterson style carnivore diet or maybe the, you know, the modified joe rogan diet um you have opinions on this yeah um essentially the the corrupt pharma influenced wants to make everybody sick so we can get everybody on drugs opinion that uh that uh point of view is uh not consistent with the scientific evidence um, and, uh, to be serious though, like we can trust, we can trust the scientific evidence for the most part. If you all, if you have the expertise to evaluate it and understand what its strengths and the weaknesses are. And when you have that expertise and you talk to the people who have been doing this their whole lives, um, the idea that you're just going to eat meat all the time. While there, you know, there's some arguments in favor of it, there's always arguments in favor of everything, uh, especially in nutrition, because nutrition, um, there's always many different outcomes in nutrition to be pursuing. So there's many different po possible goals that one could have. So according to some of those goals, a carnivore diet might make some plausible sense. But overall, if you're looking for long-term health and longevity, um, Barring you have some sort of special medical condition, it's, it's an absurd idea for everybody to be eating a carnivore diet or an animal-based diet. It's not consistent with overwhelming evidence in the medical literature. Well, well let's pick that apart a little bit. Uh, you said, we'll, we'll go to the smaller point first. The smaller point is that you said that there may be some uh, goals that if you're trying to optimize for, that a carnivore diet would make sense. What would you be trying to gain in the short term, even if you're willing to make the long term sacrifices? So the obvious one that people often cite is autoimmune issues. Now, 
with red meat, there are antigens in red meat that can cause autoimmune issues to flare. And some people actually see autoimmune issues flare on carnivore diets. But there's some people who um, don't respond uh, with their immune uh, autoimmune disease too, negatively to a carnivore diet. And so therefore they might benefit. And the other thing though, is that it may not even be the antigens. There's other mechanisms that might help with say psoriasis, there's vitamin D, there's, uh, th there's a number of different compounds that are higher in meat that might uh, be helping with autoimmune separate from those particular issues. So the classic example, as I said, is autoimmunity. And then there's, um, and when you say also, autoimmune diseases, you mean diseases like, uh, you know, psoriasis or Crohn's, yeah, ulcerative colitis. That's what a lot of people seem to anecdotally report some benefit of the carnivore diet for. Um, and maybe that, again, maybe that's because you don't have these plant proteins that are interfering with the immune system. This is, this is entirely speculative. There's zero, there's almost zero evidence to support this, but. Um, it's a plausible hypothesis that this is why some people seem to report some disease remission for their autoimmune disease, disease when going on a carnivore diet. There's other mechanisms as well, but yeah, that might be one particular application of a carnivore diet, for example. Now, the sort of larger case that I see all the time is kind of ethnographic anthropological cherry picking. Like, look here at this tribe out on the you know, the plains of Africa, and they eat nothing but meat, or perhaps more accurately, look at the Inuit living in northern Canada, northern Alaska, even in Greenland, who are legitimately eating tons and tons and tons of meat and tons and tons of fat and a very small amount of vegetables, at least in the winter. Uh, and it's like, what about those guys? And then they usually trot out some uh, heart condition, you know, like some heart uh, disease statistics, you know, and then use this to prove that everybody, regardless of what their ancestry is, would do well on an all-meat diet? Well, um, the overwhelming majority of um, hunter-gatherer groups do eat a substantial amount of carbohydrates. There's a wide range in the amount of carbohydrates consumed, a wide range in the amount of animal products consumed. Um, you can certainly take outliers like the Inuit or the Maasai, and uh, and say therefore that oh yeah well look at these people they thrive on a on on this predominantly animal based diet but um, there's a few arguments about that one is, is that if they had plant foods to eat they would eat they would be eating those plant foods like um, plant foods are highly prized by the Inuit when they can get a hold of them and sources of carbohydrate are highly prized by those groups when they get a hold of them even if this is now even becoming, I don't even want to say his name, but he's a leading carnivore diet advocate who, uh, um, I'll say his name, I'm not going to be like that. He, if Paul Saladino, he's, he, even now he's recognizing that this is the case in these hunter-gatherer groups. So, um, okay, but first of all, these are outliers. The second thing is, is with the Inuit in particular, uh, they're a relatively new group in the Arctic, they actually displaced some um, some other people. groups that were that existed there prior. Actually, they wiped them all out, and this happened about I want to say it happened about a thousand years ago. They completely displaced all the hunter hunter gatherer groups within the Arctic Circle. It was a dramatic event that is still not fully explained by archaeologists, um, and they did so through a lot of like really modern technology in terms of. Uh, what was available to hunter gatherers at the time. So the Inuit are very sophisticated in how they use technology. We know about igloos, but they're very uh, sophisticated in their hunting technology and how uh, and how they're surviving out there. And that's why they displace these other groups. So in a certain sense, they're they're not at all, you know, traditional hunter gatherers. They're quite advanced for hunter gatherers. Um, but the, the second thing that's really interesting is whenever the Inuit started existing there, there was a uh, a gene, a sweep of a certain allele, which is to say a kind of, it, it is a, there was a, um, one gene that became almost universal among the Inuit during the time shortly after they uh, colonized and took over the Arctic. And this particular gene 
uh, prevented them from entering ketosis whenever they have uh, a low carbohydrate content in their diet. So the great irony for all the keto people and the carnivore people who are saying keto is the most, um, you know, it's a help. It's an extraordinarily healthful state. It's good for you, et cetera, et cetera, which it might be in, in certain really important respects. And we should downplay the possibility that it might be uh, very beneficial um, even in the long term. But the irony is that the Inuit um, are very resistant to entering ketosis. And that might actually be because at least in their particular context of their lives, and it's for reasons that we don't fully understand right now, it's actually disadvantageous, very disadvantageous to, to be able to be in constant ketosis. So there's that whole wrinkle in the story that people don't mention. They also don't mention, of course, that they're eating mostly fish and, and highly um, unsaturated uh, uh, um, uh, fish fats. And it's not the same whatsoever as, say, like eating uh, fatty beef. And if you look at the, the uh, wild animals, most wild animals that are hunted in these say African tribes are very lean. They're not very fatty animals. They're actually quite lean. And the fat, the fatty acid composition and the amount of fat that's present in modern industrial meat is very different from the uh, amount and composition that you'd see among the vast majority of hunter-gatherer tribes. So even if we say that hunter-gatherer tribes are eating a lot of meat, the meat is quite different in terms of its fatty acid composition and in ways that are highly relevant to health outcomes. So the meat that we have in the store, uh, the fatty beef that we have in the store is very highly concentrated in saturated fatty acids. That's not to say that you didn't have some of that in some locations, not in Africa, uh, maybe many, many thousands of years ago in Africa. There's a debate about this, but um, it's arguable that the vast majority of, of human evolution in Africa took place in the context of mostly lean animals and not extremely fat animals. And certainly it's the case when you look at modern hunter-gatherers, they're not hunting down really fat animals. So if you want to go talk about hunter-gatherers eating a lot of meat, yeah, sir, a lot of them really do value animal products. I think there's no question about that, but they're, they tend not to be super fatty. And in as much as they are fatty, in as much as they go look for the fatty parts of these animals, which is going to say like the bone marrow, the internal organs, etc., the composition of these is much more unsaturated than you would find in the saturated fats in modern grocery meat, and to the point that the the unsaturated fatty acid composition in these organ meats and in the meats in the viscera that are highly prized by hunter gatherers are in many ways much more like the seed oils that are constantly denigrated by the carnivore advocates. So it's actually quite hilarious that if you really dig down and get into the nuances, which I have, because that's kind of my personality, that's why I'm a nerd in academia for 20 years, you start to understand that, uh, a lot of the claims are very incredibly oversimplified in the story of hunter-gatherers looks a lot more in some ways like some of the health recommendations made by uh, the official organizations, uh, health organizations. And, and one, to just top that off, the, one of the original pioneers of the paleo diet, Lauren Cordain, fully acknowledged all of this. He fully acknowledged that saturated fat was not a, a super common part of the, of the paleolithic hunter-gatherer diet, and yet uh, people try to ignore uh, that work done by Lauren Cordain and and uh, and and sort of just uh, gloss over it because they don't like the fact that it it disrupts the narrative of them going to the grocery store and eating all this fatty beef. Which, if you look at uh, modern medical uh, evidence and theories, like just comprehensively shown, it's like it's better than even for like the healthfulness of vaccines. And vaccines are very strong, but like. We're talking like 10 times stronger. It's some of the strongest evidence we have in all of biomedicine for the healthfulness and the importance of keeping LDL cholesterol. It's a certain kind of cholesterol that causes heart disease. Um, these saturated fatty acids raise LDL cholesterol. Like we know that. We know that's a bad thing. We know it's a bad thing. We know it for sure. So it's just a funny thing how you can look at things in terms of like this really cartoonish Flintstones understanding of how the paleolithic and how hunter gatherers actually worked but then whenever you actually think about it and read about it and go really in depth and look into the nuances a lot of like a lot of individual parts of that story end up reversing compared to what you hear on social media and it's 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 hilarious it's also terrible it's like no matter how much i say these things to people no matter how many links they provide no matter how many whatever arguments i have like most of the time people just like keep 
just plowing on with their like misconceptions and the things that they want to believe because it's you know i don't know but my that's just my rant <laughs> well it's welcome and we're going to dive deeper into it but just i mean it's interesting that when hunters go and hunt and they're going to make sausage what's the first thing they do they add pork to their beet you know if they get some venison or they get some elk what's the first thing they do they add pork to it to add fat right it's not they're not eating the the raw uh lean meat secondly you're 100 percent right that there's a very large fish component to the inuit diet at least for the most of the inuit who live along the coast there are a couple of inland groups who hunt who subsist much more on caribou but they're the minority the vast majority of the inuit live on fish and things that eat fish and thirdly, there are, um, I think it's in Samuel Hearn, you know, when you talk about them prizing vegetables, uh, an account of killing caribou that have been eating the lichen, and you can't eat lichen straight off rocks, I've tried, it's terrible, but when it gets digested in a caribou stomach, now you can eat it. So they cut the caribou open, yeah, they eat the eyeballs, they eat the fat behind the eye, but then they <laughs> cut the stomach open and they take out their vegetables, which is fermented partially digested uh, reindeer moss at the time, reindeer lichen, and eat that. So you're 100% right. I think before we go on and dive into the whole... Uh, and that's terrible. That's disgusting. Like, if you're that desperate for vegetables, man, you must be pretty desperate. <laughs> well, the, the things that people used to eat compared to what we think is civilized to eat now is crazy. But, you know, I'm a fan of blue cheese, and uh, most Asians would find that absolutely horrendously disgusting. And they'd try to one up me with their durian fruit, which I find obnoxiously disgusting. So we, we're very flexible in what we find disgusting. Uh, can you, you touch a little bit on the saturated fat versus seed oil debate? And I think maybe touch on that because there's this whole narrative that, you know, omega uh, six fatty acids are killing people by the thousands based on the seed oils. So I think we need, before we need to go on, before I let you loose on your rant there, I'm sure you have one for some strange reason. We need to define <laughs> uh, LDL, HDL, and then omega, you know, talk a little bit about the omega threes and the omega sixes, just to make sure that everybody listening to this has a background and has their definition straight. Yeah, so um, there's total cholesterol in the blood uh, that's measured through an assay that I should, I mean, it would be interesting to know more about this, but basically I think you somehow centrifuge some of the blood samples and then you isolate a particular fraction because there's a particular density and so you can extract that and that's your total cholesterol and you can measure that through some sort of uh, some sort of mechanism maybe you can uh, you could just measure the volume of that particular fraction i'm not exactly sure but in that fraction there's two fractions uh, two main fractions and one of those is uh, ldl and the other is the hdl and ldl stands for uh, low density light protein and we actually that really just means low density light protein cholesterol so the cholesterol and the low density light protein fraction of that sorry so it's basically the the, the low dense fraction of that cholesterol, that total cholesterol fraction. And then there's the high density, uh, the AL, HDL, high density lipoprotein uh, cholesterol fraction. That's the, the dense cholesterol fraction. So I guess if you centrifuge that, you find the, the denser one, like lower than the, than the, uh, than the, than the, the high density one, lower than the low density one, because dense, things that are dense, like tr go down, things that are less dense are more buoyant. So yeah, they, that's, um, that, those are the two main fractions. There's also a very low density uh, lipoprotein cholesterol fraction. And these fractions are all uh, indicative of certain, uh, whew, this is interesting, like explain this from the very bottom. So each of those fractions has a certain kind of set of molecules in it, a certain kind of set of uh, proteins of say kind of globules, think of them as like balls that are surrounded by this thing called a protein and this protein kind of keeps the balls together. And these are basically balls of fat and cholesterol that these proteins, because uh, fat and cholesterol are not soluble in the blood, they don't dissolve in the blood. You need a protein that surrounds them that then dissolves in the blood that allows them to stay in the blood and not 
um, just be these fat clumps in the blood. So you have these balls of fat and cholesterol in each of these fractions, and each of these fractions contains different kinds of balls of fat and cholesterol. And the different kinds of balls in each fraction have different functions and different biological effects. So uh, the LDL fraction, the low density like protein cholesterol fraction, um, has in particular a kind of protein that wraps around that ball. That protein is called apolipoprotein B. Just think ApoB. ApoB is um, the really important uh, lipoprotein here. And that is the protein that's taken up in your arterial walls by, um, I'm already, okay. it's taken up in your arterial walls by uh, uh, um, certain, uh, think of, think of your, the walls, your arteries. If you look at the microscopic level, there's kind of a, a, a lattice work or like maybe think of like a net. Yeah. There's like a net inside all the walls that catch things that are coming through the blood. Well, that net uniquely catches apolipoprotein B and pulls it into the arterial wall. And the reasons for this are complicated. They're, they might be related to immunity. Um, it's quite unclear because uh, the human studies that have been done in this are still very inconclusive, but for whatever reason, it's your arterial walls specifically attract ABOB, abolite to protein B, which is a part of the LDL cholesterol. That is the kind of protein that's in the LDL cholesterol fraction. Okay, and then whenever this happens, immune cells then react to that apolipoprotein B uh, and can cause an inflammatory response. And the more of that apolipoprotein B that you have in the walls of your ar arteries, the more cardiovascular disease that you have. Now, this is a really super simple version of it. You can enhance the uptake of apolipoprotein B, that is to say LDL cholesterol, that's covering the LDL cholesterol balls. You can enhance the uptake into the arterial walls through uh, inflammatory responses, things like smoking will cause it, things like high blood pressure will cause it, things like uh, uh, being obese will cause it. So um, for, for, for many different mechanisms, there's a lot of different ways that you can enhance that uptake, but the more balls that you have in any given scenario, whether it's good or bad in terms of your the context of your body, whether you're a smoker, whether you're fat, whether you're obese, etc., the more balls that you have, the uh, more aggressive atherosclerosis that you will get, and the exposure to um, to risk factors and to the high concentration of this LDL cholesterol over time determines the extent of your cardiovascular disease. Humans are perhaps in many ways uniquely predisposed to having cardiovascular disease. We start getting it early. Um, even if you compare us to say laboratory animals eating not the greatest diets in the world, they don't get atherosclerosis like humans do. We are kind of unique in our propensity towards it. And some say it's because uh, we have a very responsive immune system because we've been running all around the world, uh, colonizing everywhere. So we had to have some way of dealing with all these unique microbes. And so our body responds very strongly to, to foreign elements in the blood. And that's part of why we get atherosclerosis. That's, that's sort of the function of, of, it's the downside of a heavy immune response is getting, uh, uh, these plaques in the blood. Maybe it's because um, these plaques isolate microbes, they isolate pathogens. It's not very clear why, but it's probably related to the immune system. So we're uniquely predisposed to it. So the more, the longer you have a high concentration of ApoB in the blood, and then also these other risk factors that make having a high ApoB worse, the worse your uh, cardiovascular disease progression will be over the course of your life, which is why a lot of people end up dying from cardiovascular disease because a lot of people over the course of their lives develop atherosclerosis. Okay, so uh, the HDL fraction that I mentioned earlier, that's the LDL fraction containing the ApoB particle. The HDL fraction, it was thought up till I, I want to say the early 2000s that the HDL component was extremely important. Yeah, it was till the 2000s for um, protecting against cardiovascular disease. You want low LDL cholesterol, you want high HDL cholesterol was the story up until the 2000s. And the idea that was that the HDL protected against cardiovascular disease, but it, it turns out 
when you do studies that raise HDL cholesterol using drugs, using different kinds of interventions, although HDL is correlated with protection from cardiovascular disease, it's correlated. That means it, it, uh, people with higher HDL tend to have lower cardiovascular disease. Um, that doesn't mean that raising HDL through any sort of uh, mechanism, any sort of drug is necessarily going to reduce the risk of cardiovascular disease. So there's many drugs, many things that have been tried to raise HDL. And it turns out that uh, whenever people do that, uh, it doesn't actually reduce cardiovascular disease events. And trust me, people have tried, people want to make money on this. This is not a conspiracy. It's just that causally increasing HDL through like drugs or other mechanisms like that doesn't help with cardiovascular disease. The reason high HDL is probably related to a lower risk of cardiovascular disease is it probably has something to do with um, probably has something to do with metabolic health, basically with how much visceral fat you have and how much visceral fat is you have is probably related pretty closely to the amount of obesity that you have, but there's some genetic variation in there. So some people can get more visceral fat with lower levels of obesity. And so the more visceral fat, the more basically impaired liver function, you have kind of a, a it's like a um, there's a lipolysis of uh, uh, a lipolysis defect in the liver. I think is the theory. The more you have that, the, the lower HDL is going to be. And since um, visceral fat, for reasons of like I don't know, insulin resistance and inflammatory response, all that stuff, is causally related to cardiovascular disease. Uh, HDL will also be lower whenever you have higher cardiovascular disease, but the HDL itself is not causal. Actually, HDL, higher HDL, even though it's a sign, and this is getting a little complicated, even though it's a sign of uh, good metabolic health in general, if you could all else equal maintain the same metabolic health and bring your HDL down, you would actually reduce your risk of cardiovascular disease. HDL is itself minorly, has a modest, a small pro heart disease effect. So, um, yeah, so, so that's the whole story with LDL, HDL, and uh, that kind of thing. And just to link back to the saturated fatty acids, just to go full circle on that, um, saturated fatty acids raise LDL, they raise HDL, and in general, since you don't want to do that, all else equal, um, you, uh, you want to uh, tend to avoid uh, saturated fatty acids if you can, um, um, all else equal. Okay. So part of the, I mean, thank you. I think part of the problem here is you've given the simplified version of a very complicated biochemical cascade of which we know many components, but still there are many other components that are still mysteries. And the people who are pumping the other narrative, keep it real simple. They say something like cholesterol is good for you. Your cells are made of cholesterol. Testosterone comes from cholesterol. The Inuit, the Maasai, cholesterol is good for you. Here's one study with 20 people that showed uh, that increased cholesterol levels, increased longevity. So there, that's a very simple narrative. So how can you summarize kind of the state of the research talking about what actually happens in populations, right? If we have people or groups of people who are eating higher cholesterol versus lower cholesterol, we'll just keep it real simple. Higher saturated fat versus lower saturated fat. Is there really any doubt when we start looking at a population level? Um, the, the problem with the population level approach is that, um, People who eat higher levels of saturated fats, as I said, all else equal, if you have higher, and, and this again, like I want to, like your, your first point that you made was like, I'm making things com com complicated, but the, the fact is, is the science is complicated. It's super Agreed. I, to I totally 100% agree. And, but in terms of messaging, how do we... <laughs> I, I just, I don't know. Like, so the, the question is, is like, how do we, I can get to that. The question is, is how do we combat the really simplistic and really stupid misinformation? It's just like this, this, this hammer that people can hit over and over again. And certainly 
uh, lay people, people who, who, who just want to get along with their lives and know what to do, know what to eat, they're not going to want to like dig into the scientific literature to figure out, oh yeah, well, this is the actual nuance. So I'm, you know, I know that this is wrong or they just want to know what to do. And so it's a really big problem because I can say what people should do. Um, and then I can try to give my justification, but I can never make as simple of a story as the the, the, the misinformation and the, the charlatans can. I, I can't make a story that simple because, um, I mean, I could, I could say like LDL cholesterol bad, right? And that's good, that's correct. Like that's correct. HDL cholesterol doesn't matter that much. That's correct. Um, maintain good health, exercise, eat well, uh, maintain a good body weight, don't smoke, manage your blood pressure. All of those things are really simple messages, but I can't counter the misinformation with like a simple message because the only counter the misinformation is actually telling the story uh, or just like asserting LDL cholesterol bad. But then if I assert LDL cholesterol is bad, they're just gonna be like, oh, you're just a dummy who like believes in the old narrative and you don't know what the new science says. So like, um, I don't know a simple way to countering that misinformation. All I can say is LDL cholesterol, overwhelmingly, there's no question that it's not good. Now, are meat eaters, are meat eaters necessarily going to be at high risk of cardiovascular disease? Even red meat eaters, not necessarily, right? Because there's one really famous study, and I'm getting too complicated, and you can cut me off whenever you want if I'm getting too complicated because because you're asking for a simple thing, but I'm going to try to answer your question also. Like, so I'm, first of all, I'm saying I can't, I can't make it. If I'm trying to respond to these things, I can't make it. I'm trying to tell the truth, right? So telling the truth means it's more complicated when, than what they say. So I'm going to make it more complicated. But uh, um, there was a study called, uh, called Pure. Uh, it's by some people at McMaster and I think... I want to say there was like collaborators in Oxford or whatever. I'm not sure, but it's the main people who ran it were from McMaster in Canada. You're Canadian, right? Okay. I am. <laughs> yes. Guilty. Yes. That's how you know caribou and uh, the Inuit and stuff. Okay. So yeah, no, so the, the, uh, they ran the pure study and they showed that, uh, um, saturated fatty acids and meat and stuff, they don't, it's not associated with cardiovascular disease, but if you look at the study, like, like about a third of the countries are high income, about a third of countries are middle income, about a third of countries are low income. So if you're in a low income country and you're eating like a garbage, like white rice only diet, you're eating a poverty diet and you might even be eating a bunch of other stuff and be exposed to a bunch of other risk factors for poor health. And then you find, oh, well, like, yeah, meat, meat is actually protective against dying early. Well, I mean, it's not surprising since we're looking at countries where meat is actually associated with greater wealth and more affluence and better living conditions, et cetera, et cetera. So, and not in all contexts is meat eating necessarily going to be uh, uh, associated with higher mortality, but all else equal, if you substitute, say, and there are studies that have shown this for sure, if you substitute, uh, say, walnuts for fatty, fatty beef, yeah, you're at higher risk of cardiovascular disease, all else equal. And it's because of the mechanisms we talked about earlier, the LDL cholesterol mechanism. So we know that that's the simple story. Like you want to eat more like nuts and seeds. That's probably the best category of things that are protective. And then you want to eat less uh, like fatty meat, but also probably even maybe even in some ways worse, like ultra processed foods, things like that. Those are also very bad. So, so, um, so Kevin, Kevin Bass is saying, if you have the choice of being trapped on a desert island for 10 years and on desert island number one, there's only white rice to eat. And on desert island number two, there's white rice and, and fatty beef to eat. You should choose desert island number two because there's going to be more nutrients than what you would get compared to island. But island three, which has actually got rice and beef and nuts and seeds and salads and vegetables would be better than island two. Yeah, exactly. And that's actually kind of the point of, of, of 
a lot of misunderstandings about this. A lot of people are on, they don't have any much nutrition knowledge. They're on the standard American diet. They think they're eating healthfully because they see it on a package because some food company says this is heart healthy and it's not. And then they're eating a bunch of granola and they're becoming obese. And then some jerk on the internet says like, oh, look, if you just eat meat, you're going to be in so much better health. So they switch to just eating meat instead of this like really terrible diet standard american diet I'm like wow my health is so improved like why have everybody been lying to me all the time it's not that people have been lying to you all the time it's not that the authorities have been lying to you all the time it's kind of that we just don't have the means of educating people and food companies are lying to people all the time it's like the environment the information ecosystem the food environment we don't really understand what's healthy and we think sometimes that we're eating in a healthy manner when we're actually not and just because you eat a carnivore diet and get more healthy doesn't mean that um, that the experts that are talking about uh, nutritional recommendations were wrong. It may be that what you were eating was not consistent with what those nutritional recommendations actually are. I, I, I mean, the, the carnivore diet or the paleo diet has got a couple of fallacies built into it, or appeals to a couple of fallacies. Number one, that natural is better. And number two, that older is better than new. And it appeals to this idea that back in Africa, here's what we used to do. Well, I mean, if you, I'm going to pump another podcast. If you listen to Patrick Wyman's Tides of History podcast, which talks a lot about prehistory, it's clear that there is no one paleo way of being. There were paleo groups that were farming. There were paleo groups that were gathering. There were paleo groups that were eating fish. There's paleo groups that were eating um, some tuber in the jungle. And to, to lump this all in and create this fantasy of, uh, you know, hunters eating nothing but saber-toothed tiger and uh, mammoth meat is, is bullshit. And it appeals to this manly vision of the past where this is how it was done and that everything old is better. Well, I mean, let alone all the studies showing that, you know, the average lifespan was something like 28 years or, or whatever. So, you know, it, cats in the wild used to eat mice. Okay, then the average cat used to live a couple of years. I mean, I've had cats. They've lived like 16, 17 years on shitty food from uh, from the supermarket. Uh, that's not their natural diet, and they live a lot longer. They seem pretty happy to me. Yeah. Um, uh, I, as you pointed out, there's many paleo diets. And in fact, if you look at the fossil record and you look at studies done on some of the tooth enamel, you can see very clearly that we've been eating grains for freaking forever since like the beginning of time. Was it a, as big of a part of the diet as say, it, you know, it is in China or in like modern agricultural societies after the Neolithic? No, but we've been eating these kinds of foods forever um, because if you can get them, then you're and they have calories. You're gonna get. You're gonna eat them. But the question is, is among all of these different paleo diets, like which one is the best? Which one is the best paleo diet? Which one is the most healthy? You can't answer that by like. You can't, I mean, how are you gonna answer that? You could like try to look at the tribes and see if they're healthy, but like. Is it are they healthy because of their diet, or is it because they just were prosperous in those years, or like what is the reasons? Like, so the way that we resolve that question is with science like we use science and not to say that nutrition science knows everything nutrition science doesn't know a lot because nutrition science is very uh protean it's very like it's very unformed it's not an advanced like really it, it, because because of the methods available to it we can't uh we can't tr put people in cages and feed them their whole lives and then to study the, the effects that's one of the big reasons but um but nutrition science does know a few things and it does have methods that uh on the whole point in certain directions and in some ways are conclusive on some particular topics and so we can use though you can we can use that aspect of nutrition science in order to um to help us to and to inform us about which paleo diet quote unquote might be best another interesting thing is yes as, as you pointed out things that are old are best like that's that tend to be how we think you know why not just go back to the basics or you know <laughs> so um 
you know, as you know, Hodger Gracie, like one, you know, uh, he was the best in the world based on the basics, right? So the basics aren't, are not the, 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 the worst thing in the world to, to lean on. But it is interesting to, to note that mice certainly don't eat ketogenic diets, but whenever you put mice on certain kinds of ketogenic diets, um, especially make sure their calories are in check because mice can often get obese on ketogenic diets. But if you put them on certain kinds of ketogenic diets, make sure their calories are in check, they live longer. You know, higher median, but then why? That's not a mouse diet. Why are you feeding a mouse on a ketogenic diet and they're living longer? Well, maybe the ancestral diet of mice isn't necessarily the best diet for the health of mice, which is crazy to think about. The diet to which they evolved is not necessarily the best diet for longevity. And the reason for this is that uh, we didn't evolve. Maybe it has well more short term payoffs. Maybe right. it has short term payoffs and increased ability to reproduce at an earlier age. And then you you live longer, but evolution doesn't really care what happens to you in your dotage. Yes. Uh, well, that, that brings us to a point. A lot of nutrition science seems to be making assertions about population level things. If everybody in society ate, I don't know, I'm going to make a statement. If everybody in society ate half the amount of processed meats that they eat and twice as many vegetables, that overall the society would have less cancer and we'd have a longer lived society. That's, that's probably something like that is true. But it, what about dialing it down to the individual? Because I know some people do really well on things like the keto diet and some people like myself, when I did it, did horrendously. I've told this story before, but my doctor, I did blood work before and I did blood work after. And I was gonna check in with my doctor after a month of being on keto. I didn't get a chance to, because he called me at home personally <laughs> having seen my blood work, which I'd looked at that morning and basically gone, holy shit, like my HDL had plummeted, my LDL had gone through the roof, my ratios were all off, my triglycerides were through the roof, and I'd been doing a really strict keto diet. So for Stefan Kesting, it's the worst possible diet, but maybe for Kevin Bass, it works. So how do we tease out the individual variation here and your genetics versus my genetics? I don't know, your gut biome versus my gut biome, your exercise regimen versus my exercise regimen, all the variables here. How do we find out what's best for the individual? Acknowledging that as what's best for the individual might not be the same as what's best on average for everybody. Yeah, that's, that's a really interesting point. Um, Hmm. I, I, mean, I imagine that down the road we'll we'll have more detailed tools to take a look at your genetics and say, oh, you've got I don't know, you've got an APO two, you've got two APOE two alleles, you've got an APOE two and an APOE four, you know, like alleles, sort of variations of specific genes. Here's here's your genetics. Here's what we think will work for you, and here's your genetics, and your genetics are different, and we can know we can predict what might be better for you maybe you need i don't know more fiber and i need more uh i don't know more fat yeah um yeah yeah um we're starting to get some of that knowledge now uh we don't have a lot of it yet we don't have it yet translated into clinical recommendations but we're probably pretty close to doing that and we probably have the knowledge and the information to start doing that um, I'm sure there's companies that are doing it and someday probably within the next, you know, 10 to 20 years, we'll have a pretty comprehensive way of profiling people based on their genetics and, uh, we'll be able to, to advise them about what might or might not be a good approach for their health. For example, for me, I know based on, uh, some of the SNPs that I have, uh, the, the genes that I have, I have, um, a propensity towards hypertension, so high blood pressure. Um, and so I try to make sure not to eat as much salt, but it's interesting. So um, you saw that your lipids went out of control. It, it looked terrible. Your doctor even called you. That's, that's a funny story. Um, so I guess in that case, like it worked, right? So your doctor, uh, you know, you went, you're going to the doctor, he flagged it. He said, okay, you got to make sure we tell him about this to uh, inform him that this doesn't look like such a good idea, whatever he's doing. Um, 
and 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 then you change your behavior ac accordingly. So we we do have some really good tools for uh, estimating and predicting what kinds of uh, things are happening to people. There, um, there's probably going to be more that are will emerge in the future that we can do again more upstream, more before you even try the diet. But we can we can test and surveil and evaluate. And the the problem with a lot of the the online discussion about diets is that those tools, looking at lipids, for example, or looking at inflammation, those tools are often by the communities that uh, feel threatened by them. So it tends to be the case, but not with everybody. It tends to be the case that that a keto diet will, especially an animal-based versus a, more of a plant-based nuts and seeds, with an animal-based ketogenic diet or a carnivore diet, it tends to be the case that lipids increase. So LDL cholesterol, triglycerides, well, sometimes triglycerides, but it tends to be the case that LDL increases. But what, what the people in the carnivore and ketogenic diet communities often do online is they try to deny the role of LDL cholesterol and cardiovascular disease because that uh, disrupts the narrative that they have that their diet is going to be the best diet for everybody, in which case they take away the tools from people that they can use to then evaluate whether or not the diet is working for them. And people then believe that they don't actually need to be looking at their uh, LDL cholesterol, which is, it's not true. Um, and, and, uh, and so we do have the tools, but they're being kind of uh, sabotaged by, by online influencers and, and people are getting our information. And this recently happened with one guy. His name was, I think, he goes by a carnivore kid on, on uh, Twitter. Uh, he, he's in perfect health. He's been in perfect health for a long time. He's lean. He looks great. Uh, but he had a heart attack. And that's because he's got really elevated LEO cholesterol. He had not, I think he didn't have a heart attack. He had a certain arrhythmia that he detected on his watch. They looked at his heart. They saw like blockages everywhere. They had to do like triple or quadruple bypass, emergency quadruple bypass surgery, open heart surgery on him. Uh, he thought following Ivor and, and, uh, Ivor Cummins and like, uh, uh, Dave Feldman and, and those guys, he thought that he was okay because he was taking his vitamin K2. He's taking his D3. He was in good metabolic health, low insulin, low fasting insulin, all that stuff. He thought he was okay. And then he had a severe athero atherosclerosis, um, because he was lied to about what the science says. So yeah, I think we have some of the basic tools to test. And people uh, should try things if, if, if say the, the guidelines aren't working for them and they want to try things, that's great. But, you, but pay attention to what your doctors say because their doctors kind of know what they're talking about. Like I didn't sometimes I, I come from this space too, right? I, I haven't told your listeners this, but I come from being like a nutter also. Like I wasn't on keto. I didn't believe LDL cholesterol caused heart disease. I didn't believe that uh, statins were good for you. And, uh, um, and I went to med, med school classes thinking that my professors were morons because I was an arrogant medical student. But when I started my PhD, I started learning a little bit more. And, um, and yeah, I, I learned that, uh, uh, you know, I learned that that stuff is not true. And, and what I'm saying is, is like, even intelligent people can get taken in by this kind of stuff. And you should listen to your doctor and pay real, you take it really seriously. So that's all I'll say about that. Okay. Now, to bring this back to the purported uh, original purpose of my podcast, which is combat sports and uh, jiu-jitsu and grappling and punching people in the head, uh, you're no stranger to wrestling around with men wearing spandex. Uh, you you do a lot of no gi. You're familiar. Well, almost with... naked, yeah, no shirtless, yeah, hugging them, <laughs> sweating. Oh, you're you're from the nothing but bad boy shorts era. <laughs> yeah, I did. I do some of that sometimes. Yeah, especially I forget to bring my my stuff, so I like. Yeah, I'm just, it's it's fun, you know. It's fun if you, if you ignore that, you know, framing to it, Steven. So, <laughs> so. You recently had a thread on Twitter that I thought was really interesting because I think the great tragedy of the martial arts, the great tragedy of MMA, of boxing, is brain damage. And yeah. obviously in the last 10 years, the amount of awareness of brain damage and CTE, chronic traumatic encephalopathy, and the connection to the neurodegenerative diseases has just exploded. But... Uh, you, you had something about t extrapolating evidence from animal studies to if you are going to do striking, 
how are you going to, what nutritional steps can you take to protect your brain? And I think you were pretty careful about framing it as like, <laughs> we don't know if this will work, but it's unlikely to do harm. Uh, so could you, could you go into your, I don't know, your, the Kevin Bass protocol. So you will never, ever get CTE. <laughs> You'll be protected from CTE forever. And, uh, please send me uh, money if you decide to use my protocol, like at least a hundred dollars. So a thousand, maybe, um, no, uh, yeah, because you will never get CTE. Um, so <sighs> I'll just really briefly, because I don't want to nerd out too much, but we don't have uh, tons of time left, but it's based on animal studies. Essentially, there's some human studies, weak uh, evidence, weak kind of human studies, meaning they're not conclusive. They're not designed well enough to be uh, definitive in terms of what doctors would normally want, want in order to make recommendations. And there's many hypotheses and many ideas that people have, and then they test them in very rigorous controlled settings and find out that they're not correct. So uh, that's the caveat. But based on a really actually substantial amount of animal research and then some human research, there's a few things that I think uh, might be beneficial. And I talked to a UFC fighter the other night about this. This is part of the context. Uh, um, so creatine monohydrate supplementation, it's going to help you with training in general, uh, anaerobic performance mostly. And then if you're doing weightlifting, it's going to get you a few more reps out. And that is hypothesized to increase the amount of uh, um, growth potential that you have. The more reps you get, the more growth potential. So then you end up getting bigger and more bigger muscles. But it also just acutely increased performance. It'll make it so that you can uh, just, you know, go a little bit longer in the gym with your, uh, with your, with your uh, shirtless sweaty buddies. So, um, but in addition to that, there are really interesting animal studies indicating, like a lot of them indicating that if you pre-treat animals with creatine, you just give them creatine, they load up for five days ahead of time. Uh, and then you hit them in the head really hard. Uh, and you look at their brains afterwards, the ones who receive creatine like have like half as much damage as the ones who, who don't. It's like, if you look at the amount of damage, like the, the infarct or the, the lesion in the brain, you see like it's like half the size in the ones who pre treat creatine, which is super interesting. And it's probably because creatine is providing extra energy, an alternative source of energy that allows the neurons to survive longer. It's probably a little bit more complicated than that. But um, yeah, so that's super interesting. So I would say as part of the BAS protocol, <laughs> this would be terrible if people start using this uh, and saying the BAS protocol, but as part of the BAS protocol, um, you would want to take three to five grams of creatine a day. It'll help you with your training. It'll help you with, uh, with, with, uh, potential, uh, CTE over time. And you want to make sure to do it every single day. Uh, if you're going up to a fight, if there's a fight soon and you want to make weight, creatine will add maybe three to five pounds on average to people because it sucks water into the muscles. Um, and because it does that, it'll make it a little bit harder to make weight if you're close. So the best way to deal with that is not to take creatine within about 60 days. Some people say 30, but if you want to be really safe, 60 days before a fight and not be on creatine uh, if you're going to be called up on short notice for a fight. So, um, but you can, so during your rehydration period after making weight, uh, add the creatine back uh, as much as 25 grams. But if you can, it would be nice to do even more over the course of, say, 24 hours and do it evenly spaced over the course of 24 hours as you rehydrate. You would want to make it evenly spaced. Um, you could do maybe up to 100 grams of creatine, but make sure if you do more than 25 grams that you've done it before, you've practiced it, you've seen what the effects are before uh, this 24 hour rehydration period, because there's a potential for diarrhea. So make sure that you know how much your body can actually take before you do it. And if you don't know that, then make sure to stick to only 25 grams in that 24 hour period and you should be safe. Uh, and then you'll get a little bit of, a, of an enhanced effect. And then, uh, as far as your performance is concerned, a slight, a modest improvement in performance and then uh, modest neuroprotection if this effect is real. And then you continue to take the creatine, dose the creatine after fight night. That's what I would do if I was a striker about to fight. 
In addition to creatine, uh, fish oil is a good idea. It has the same sorts of impact in animal models in the studies that I've been talking about, the same kind of impact. You take that again every day, say one to two to three grams, that'd be great. Same thing. Uh, and since you're not going to have to worry about weight cutting, you don't have to really worry about not taking it at any point. Um, I didn't mention in a thread, and this I just occurred to me uh, in the morning, I think yesterday, there's a really strong clinical trial literature in humans, really strong human studies showing that uh, dark berries are uh, protective of cognition during aging. So uh, that's probably the strongest so Blueberries, evidence. blackberries, cherries, that sort of thing? Yes. Yep. Yep. I think blueberries in particular was the ones, but I think any kind of like blue, black, raspberries, probably cherries as well. Yeah. Anything like that will, will be beneficial. So if you consume those on a regular basis, eat those every day, whether or not you're a fighter, your cognition is probably going to be better in the long run. So that's something that's applicable to everybody. And that's something that I do personally. Uh, I do all these things. Um, and then the last thing, Acutely after a striking sparring session, you can take a niacin. And again, the same sort of animal studies as you'd see with creatine or with uh, the fish oil. Um, you get, you're going to get That's a the stuff that gives you the giant skin flush when you take it? Yeah. So there's two kinds of it's, – it's really interesting. Uh, there's two kinds of niacin. There's, and most actually, if you go into the store these days, most of them are extended release. I can't remember the, the, the way that they do it, but there's some way that they package it that makes it so that it's extended release. And being extended release, it doesn't cause a skin flushing. Now, do you want the skin flushing? Do you not want the skin flushing? Uh, I don't know. Like maybe having the skin flushing means more activation of this particular pathway. So maybe you want – it's it's actually unclear. And so don't – hopefully people are not going to turn that into like a dogma. Yes, you must have the skin flushing in order to get the effect. Like that's the way you do it, bro. But um, – I don't know. Like if you want to be aggressive, like hit it hard, you know? So up to like one to two grams, how much, however much you can tolerate and then do that, uh, at least the, the night after. And then maybe, or the, you know, that like immediately after your sparring session, maybe for a couple of days thereafter. And that should also reduce your, um, your, uh, uh, potentials brain trauma, according to this, uh, limited evidence in animals and we need to start getting more evidence in humans and I think we'll probably get that soon of the next you know decade or two but for now this is what we've got and I think that those four uh, nutritional strategies are the best that we have for from a nutritional standpoint given the current evidence we have right now yeah and and I think it's important to note that they're unlikely to do harm in the same yes. way that at the early part of the COVID outbreak People were like, vitamin D and magnesium are the answer. And the evidence for it at the time was pretty weak. But on the other hand, taking, as long as you don't think it's some magic protective umbrella that's going to deflect the uh, the COVID fairies, it's unlikely to do harm. So right. I was, I was taking vitamin D and I was taking magnesium, not thinking it would protect me, but what's the downside? Sure. And And so maybe it did help, maybe it didn't but it's unlikely to have harmed me as opposed to, you know, I don't know, uh, bloody ivermectin or hydroxychloroquine, which can have negative, you know, in the case of hydroxychloroquine actually decreased survivability of the damn illness. Yeah. I, I think, um, these things, even, <laughs> uh, I'm known to like, troll, troll a lot, probably more than I should, but I think like ivermectin is probably not, going to hurt anybody uh it's the, the the real harm for that stuff as you know is where people start saying it's going to cure me use it instead of a vaccine like like uh, brett weinstein and people like that like use it like i'm i'm only doing ivermectin i'm not getting the vaccine like that's where that's where uh it becomes harmful that's where even vitamin d all this stuff becomes harmful because it becomes either these natural remedies versus ooh big pharma stuff that's going to hurt you kind of stuff like, that's that's where that narrative is harmful so yeah don't believe that any of these four things are going to like Bulletproof from CDE. Make sure to, to spar responsibly. Don't go harder because now you've heard, heard me say this on the podcast. Like, you know, spar responsibly. Um, there's some people who don't even, I think, uh, I want to say like Max Holloway doesn't even uh, do hard 
super hard sparring anymore. So um, you can still, uh, yeah. So so still be very responsible with with uh, with your head striking and stuff like that for sure. Well, thank you so much for your time today, Kevin. Uh, I know you've got a website. You're very active on Twitter. Can you tell people how they can find you and follow you and watch, you know, some of your <laughs> trolling, <laughs> but more importantly, get the, the your take on some of these really quite complicated topics. But but I mean, there is just no way around it. This stuff is complicated, and so you you you. If you're going to be playing in this field, you do need information. Yeah. I mean, if people want to dive deeper and learn a little bit beyond what their doctor's saying so they can understand why their doctor's saying what they're saying and then kind of understand what the, you know, the cutting edge of, of, uh, of longevity science says or doesn't say, I often criticize the people who go way beyond what um, is reasonable. Uh, yeah. Follow me. Uh, I have a, a growing presence on Instagram in particular, uh, basically it's going to be Kevin in Bass, K-E-V-I-N, and then another N. So there's going to be two Ns. N is my middle initial. And then B-A-S-S, -S, and that's going to be on Instagram, uh, Twitter, uh, TikTok, and YouTube. And uh, basically I just put, I'm posting three-minute videos. Give me any feedback on my videos. That's sort of my new baby is trying to build those and make those reasonable. And sometimes people like them. Sometimes people think... Uh, I'm boring. And the reason people think I'm boring is I'm trying to be boring sometimes because I'm saying stuff that's like really could be inflammatory if I like went too hard with it. So I kind of like make it sound more boring than it really is because um, I don't get in trouble. Um, yeah. So you can find me in those. And uh, of course, my website is the Diet Wars, you know, T-H-E Diet Wars, the Diet Wars dot com. And uh, I don't post a whole lot to that website anymore. I might update it pretty soon or I might not. I'm mostly activated or active on the social media websites, and pretty much if you if you get me on Instagram or Twitter, you're going to get most of my stuff. But uh, yeah. Okay. Well, good luck with your PhD, and good luck with the transition from the ivory tower to the uh, to the doctor's office. But I, I, I look forward to following you as you continue your uh, the next evolution of your career. Thank you so much. It was an honor to be invited and to be a guest on your podcast. Thank <laughs> you.